Yeah, Hi, everyone. Yeah, welcome. it's good to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last but not the least speaker of the seminar series four of Spatial Amex. And as I, as I mentioned, we are working on the fifth seminar series. And if you're interested in presenting, please reach out to us. And uh, it's, it could be any, you know, any place from Industrial Academy. So the next one will be a mix of both, and hopefully it will be exciting. And today, we are very excited to have um, Professor Sang Zong from UCSD. And Professor Zong is a professor of bioengineering at UCSD. And previously, he was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for about seven years. And he received his degrees from Tech University and Harvard. And uh, after a short um, Stanford distant scholar position, he started his faculty positions. And currently, he leads the team for systems biology at the UCSD. And he received many awards. I'm going to name a few. One of them is NIH Director's Pioneer Award, NIH Catalyst Award in Diabetes, and NIH Director's New Innovative Award, NSF Career Award, and Alfred Sloan Fellowship. And uh, uh, his eight previous trainings actually now contributing to tenure track positions. And that's actually very impressive. Too. And uh, without actual further ado, I'd like to turn to Dr. Zong for this exciting seminar. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for the very nice introduction. I'm glad to have this opportunity to share with you some of our interests on studying the spatial distribution of RNA. And I wish to speak uh, today to share what does RNA do on chromatin and on cell surface. So the long-term goal of my lab is to understand the functions of different parts of the human genome. While we now have good information about 10% of the human genomic sequences functions, including their roles in as coding or non-coding genes, uh, their roles as regulatory sequences, as promoters and enhancers, uh, there remain to have a large fraction of the human genomic sequence that do not have its all functions annotated. So how we go about to study the functions of the vast majority of the remaining genomic sequences of the human genome. So one striking observation that uh, struck me was that more than 60% of the human non-coding genome is transcribed into RNA. So we thought that perhaps by inferring, by studying and identifying the functions of these transcripts, uh, we could start to have a view of the functions of the underlying genomic sequence. And uh, we hope to identify the functions by studying the localization and interactions of this RNA. So I hope to share uh, two research directions from our lab. So one is on chromatin associated RNA. Uh, this RNA attached to different parts of the genome. And I wish to discuss whether they serve as a type of epigenetic regulatory material. Uh, the other type of RNA is stably attached to cell surface. And I hope to use the second half of this uh, seminar to discuss whether they represent a type of cell surface molecule and be perhaps be responsible uh, for signaling. So the, for the first type, uh, chromatin associated RNA, uh, so these RNAs are transcribed from one gene and they sometimes uh, travel and attach to another gene on the same chromosome. And sometimes they somehow travel and attach to the genomic sequence of another gene on a different chromosome and mediate transcription regulation. So a few of the already discovered pathways for this RNA mediated transcription regulation, uh, including, for example, the RNA help to uh, stabilize transcription factor chromatin interactions. The RNA contribute to uh, modify the histone, uh, histone decorations near uh, the target gene, or perhaps the RNA help to stabilize uh, certain 
uh, spatial arrangements of the underlying genomic sequences. Uh, so our main questions when we started to investigate this type of RNAs are as follows. The first is what are the chromatin associated RNAs? Uh, previously we've seen a few examples from literature, uh, but in general, what genes or intergenic sequences give rise to these CA RNAs? The second question is, what do the CA RNA bind in the genome? Where are the genomic binding sites or interaction sites of each chromatin associated RNA? And the third question is, do any of the binding correlate with transcription levels of the target genes? So to study, uh, to ask these questions from a uh, unbiased manner, uh, several postdocs, including Dr. Wei Xin Wu and uh, Chui Nguyen, uh, have continuously developed and updated uh, technology, which we call MARGI, Mapping RNA Genome Interactions Technology. Uh, the more recent version is called in situ MARGI, IMARG, uh, that is meant to system systematically discover in an all versus all manner all the nuclear transcriptome versus genome uh, interactions in one experiment. So the idea of this technique is that suppose on our genome, on different parts of our genome, there are different RNA molecules attached to different parts, and we wish to stabilize those interactions by cross-linking the cells. We fragment the genome and sometimes also the RNA uh, so that in some of the fragments, we would have a piece of DNA and a piece of RNA uh, that uh, is stabilized together. Then we wish to convert this DNA and its proximal RNA into a unique piece of DNA that can be sequenced by DNA sequencer. Uh, the way that Wei Xin and Tri did this was to introduce a linker that is ligated to one end of the RNA and through another round of proximal ligation, if there is DNA in the spatial neighborhood of this RNA, then this linker will be ligated to the proximal DNA fragment as well, thus forming an RNA linker DNA chimeric sequence. In, then in a few subsequent steps, uh, this chimeric sequence is converted into double-stranded DNA suitable for typical next generation sequencing. With paired end sequencing, uh, we can actually know which end uh, corresponds to the original RNA and which end cor corresponds to the original DNA and thus use a read pair to infer a particular interaction between one RNA and its target genomic sequence. So below here is an example of uh, inferred interaction between MALAT1 RNA which, whose gene is on chromosome 11 uh, to uh, this target genomic region uh, near this KTN1 gene on chromosome 14. Uh, so here, every row is a read pair uh, where uh, the RNA end is mapped and shown in red block, and the DNA end is also mapped, uh, shown uh, in a blue block. Uh, in this case, we see that uh, all these read pairs were mapped to the RNA of the MALAT1, and they are associated with the genomic uh, neighborhood of this KTN1 gene. And these read pairs are used collectively to infer uh, interchromosomal interaction uh, between the MALAT1 RNA uh, to the genomic sequence around uh, this target gene. So this type of data in a genome-wide uh, is typically now summarized into uh, RNA versus DNA contact matrix. Uh, in this matrix here, what's shown on the y-axis uh, is the entire chromosome one, uh, starting from uh, its start position uh, to its end position, uh, which spans uh, approximately 100 megabases. And uh, the same chromosome is also plotted on the x-axis as well from start to end on the right. Uh, 
and any RNA DNA interactions identified by uh, a MAGI read pair is added to this contact matrix somewhere corresponding to the origin of the RNA and the target position of the DNA. And if we were to sum up all these read pairs and use this um, uh, red to white heat map to represent how much RNA DNA interaction is at each corresponding location of the genome. Uh, here is, um, and then we derive this uh, contact matrix. And if we were to zoom in uh, to, to this is about 25 megabases near the end of this chromosome, uh, we see that uh, the RNA transcribed at each row location uh, seem to uh, reach to a neighborhood of the genomic sequence and sometimes can reach uh, several megabase away of its own gene. I just, if uh, in, coincidentally, if we were to superimpose the known super enhancers uh, in blue stripes, uh, we see that in this case that the RNA is transcribed um, from super enhancers tend to heavily decorate uh, its uh, large genomic uh, neighborhood. So there is a general, uh, there is a large amount of chromatin-associated RNAs that are transcribed uh, from super enhancers. And through this type of uh, matrix summary, uh, we could start to identify trans chromatin, RNA chromatin interactions in Cs, uh, where uh, this is mostly uh, from the diagonal, uh, where you see that uh, the, essentially the target position is not too far away from where the RNA is transcribed from. Uh, uh, from this type of analysis, if we were to analyze uh, interchromosomal contact matrix, we will also derive those uh, interchromosomal RNA chromatin interactions or long range uh, RNA chromatin interactions. So the uh, data analysis pipeline has been uh, packaged into a software tool uh, that doesn't require compilation or, or, or tuning. Or, or actually, uh, this is uh, so utilizing uh, the Docker technology that enables anyone, uh, any uh, computer running on any operation system uh, to directly uh, run this software. Uh, so that this will take reference genome and, and this will take the IMRG read pairs. Uh, currently, we are also developing a single cell version of this. Uh, so there are sometimes there's a cell barcode uh, in there. Uh, take this as input, and eventually it will generate uh, the uh, RNA DNA interaction pairs and can be uh, plugged into other visualization software. So now, if we were to come back and see what are the chromatin interacting non coding RNAs, uh, so we're analyzing two cell types in this case uh, the human embryonic kidney and the embryonic stem cells, uh, we see a sizable hundreds of snow RNA, small nuclear RNA, as well as antisense and pseudogene transcripts are uh, in uh, chromatin associated RNAs. They seem to decorate uh, the chromatin. And if we ask how far do these genes travel uh, to interact with target genomic sequences, the majority of them, as we were seeing in the diagonal line of the previous contact matrix, the majority of them contact to their genomic neighborhood uh, forming cis interactions. Uh, still approximately 20% of the interactions are either long range interactions or interchromosomal uh, interactions. If we ask, uh, uh, is there any favorable target genomic regions that many chromatin associated RNA uh, accumulate at? Uh, in this case, uh, we plotted all the transcription star sites and their uh, 20,000 bases flanking regions, 10 KB upstream, 10 KB downstream, of every gene uh, in the current genome, uh, human genome assembly. Here we have approximately 20, 34,000 genes uh, showing as 34,000 rows. And for each gene, for each row, uh, we plotted the transcription start site of the gene at the center. And then uh, 10K upstream and 10K downstream. At the, the signal intensity here 
is the cumulative amount of RNA DNA contacts at that position. So it, uh, looking across all the transcription star sites of the entire genome, uh, we see that uh, almost always uh, the transcription star site and its immediate genomic neighborhood sequence is where the uh, chromatin associated RNA is targeting. Uh, whereas if we go further upstream and downstream, uh, there is far less uh, RNA attachment uh, to the upstream and downstream. But these, all the, most of the observed RNA chromatin interactions uh, seem to accumulate right at uh, the center of the transcription star site. Now we have ordered by the cumulative attachment level at the transcription star site of all the genes. Uh, we could ask uh, if uh, this ordering actually order uh, the gene expression level of these genes. Uh, for that purpose, uh, for every gene, every row, uh, we plotted its uh, gene expression level uh, by RNA sequencing. So now that the expression level of every gene corresponds to a dot on the same row, uh, the x-axis uh, is represents the expression level of that gene. Uh, so uh, apparently we probably wouldn't expect that one uh, indicator would precisely tell me the expression level. Uh, nevertheless, if I were to use a rounding average across genes, uh, we still see a strong, uh, a clear positive correlation between how much chromatin associated RNA is attached to the transcription star site of a gene and on average, the expression level of that gene in the same cell type. And if I were to make a quick summary of what we've been uh, spoken. And so there are now a few technologies for uh, all versus all approach of mapping all the chromatin associated RNAs and the respective genomic interaction sequences of each uh, chromatin associated RNA. And so I described the IMRG technology uh, from my lab uh, that was originally described in this uh, 2017 current biology paper. And uh, in 2019, uh, we improved it into in situ IMRG, I, IMRG and, and described the protocol and data analysis protocol uh, in nature protocols. Uh, there are now uh, a few other technologies, uh, including GridSeq, CharSeq, and mo most recently, uh, RadicalSeq, uh, which um, in general uses a very similar idea, uh, but with slight variations uh, in the protocols uh, that attempt uh, to do the same thing. And uh, we put this together uh, in a review article uh, to review these technologies. Uh, coming back to the key questions that we wanted to ask uh, a few years back. Uh, first is, what are the chromatin associated RNAs? Now that uh, we uh, leveraging IMRG, uh, we have seen hundreds of chromatin associated RNAs, uh, including non-coding link RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, and enhancer derived eRNAs. And where do this uh, chromatin associated RNAs bind in the genome, uh, they tend to target transcription star sites of genes. Uh, even if a gene is not activated at this moment in this cell, uh, but there often is already accumulated uh, chromatin associated RNA on its promoter. And uh, we observed in general a positive correlation of uh, the amount of RNA chromatin associated RNA accumulating at the promoter and the transcription level of uh, the target gene of, of this promoter. Uh, so leveraging this uh, information, uh, we wanted to ask if chromatin associated RNA contribute, can contribute to understand a disease generation process. And so we have two questions of strong interest to our lab for several years. And one is, why diabetes-induced blood vessel endothelial dysfunctions are irreversible? Uh, the second question is, uh, how are the fusion RNAs created in cancer? And so I'm going to briefly discuss uh, each case and what we learned there. 
Uh, the first question is regarding the blood vessel. Uh, many of the type, type 2 diabetic patients suffer from uh, symptoms not uh, directly is per se diabetes, but the uh, all types of symptoms arise from different organs. And one of the theme of all those organ problems and failures is their blood cell, blood vessel is deteriorated. And uh, most apparently is the most inner layer of the blood vessel, which is called the epithelium. Uh, this first layer of cells uh, is one cell type. Uh, it's a single layer cell type. Uh, these are called uh, the, the endothelial cells and they form the endothelium. I'm sorry, I said epithelium. It, it's an endothelium as opposed to epithelium. And it's, a, it's an endothelium formed by a single layer of cells. Uh, so these cells are critically important uh, in regulating the perfusion and exchange of nutrients and, and many molecules inside and outside of the bloodstream. And turn out uh, these uh, endothelial cells uh, turn out to be uh, stressed and become dysfunctioned uh, by uh, in diabetic people. Uh, so our uh, interest is actually a long-standing question: is how come that so far we essentially there's no way uh, to revert even to intervene uh, the deterioration of the endothelium uh, in diabetic patients? And so. In order to investigate this question again, <laughs> uh, so we collaborated with Dr. Zhen Chen's lab at City of Hope. Uh, here shown uh, Dr. Yi Jun Luo is from uh, Zhen Chen's lab. And uh, Zhen's lab did two things. One is that uh, they generated a disease model uh, using a patient-derived endothelial cells and stress them with high glucose plus inflammatory signal to mimic the environment they would be experiencing in diabetic patients by the, the diabetic blood. And we assayed these cells in parallel by high c high c is a technique interrogating DNA-DNA interactions, and by IMRG interrogating RNA chromatin interactions. And here shows the contact matrix of part of chromosome 2 uh, to part of chromosome 7. Uh, we see that there's almost uh, minimal, if any, RNA transcribed from chromosome 2 interacting with any of the chromosome 7 DNA shown in this map in the control normal endothelial cells. As the cells get stressed, um, after a few days, uh, we see uh, a strong interaction from uh, RNA uh, or, or a stretch of RNA molecules transcribed from a super enhancer from chromosome 2 to target a genomic region uh, on uh, chromosome 7 uh, near the serpine 1 gene. Uh, so these are the read pairs of the IMRG uh, read pairs, uh, suggesting uh, interchromosome interaction uh, from a link RNA, a link RNA which actually is embedded in a super enhancer that seem to travel across chromosome to interact with serpine 1 gene. Uh, when we uh, targeted it, to degrade uh, this uh, link RNA in the nuclei of endothelial cells, uh, we actually can suppress the expression of the subprime 1 gene. Turned out subprime 1 is a key regulator of inflammation and that, uh, in endothelial cells that is uh, responsible uh, for many of the deterioration and inflammation of the endothelial cells. Uh, so at this point, uh, we see a case example uh, where uh, we have an interchromosomal RNA DNA interaction uh, that uh, underlying at least is part of uh, the seemingly reversible process of uh, endothelial dysfunction. We wish to ask, is this a spatial case or is this a general phenomenon? Uh, so in, for that purpose, we uh, used the same IMRG data to tease out all the other major targets of this link RNA. And we identified, this is on the order of 10 of other targets uh, that were uh, bound in the dysfunctional EC endothelial cells by the link RNA. And we thought we could validate 
this in the leveraging single cell transcriptome data. So the idea, actually the idea was recommended, was suggested by a reviewer. The, uh, the reviewer suggested that if indeed uh, this RNA, uh, this link RNA can activate uh, these target genes from different chromosomes, what you expect to see is that in single cells, you would have more and more single cells uh, in the deteriorating uh, endothelial, uh, in the de deteriorating blood vessel, and more and more single cells would co-express this link RNA and its target gene. And it turned out it's indeed the case. Uh, so we uh, generated single cell transcriptome uh, from this disease model uh, using both comparing both stressed and control endothelial cells. And we also uh, assayed uh, type 2 diabetic people's endothelium and healthy donors endothelium uh, by single cell transcriptome. Uh, so the y-axis represent an odds ratio representing the chance of this gene pair uh, to co-express uh, in the stressed cells or in the type 2 diabetic patients endothelial cells. So the more, uh, the higher the odds ratio, the more conversion from these two genes being not co-expression to co-expression in the bad condition. And so we see that the prime one happens to be uh, the strongest co-expressing, uh, conforming to the idea that it's under regulation uh, by uh, link 607. Uh, a few other uh, genes, uh, every of these genes, let me say, have a, a positive uh, log odds ratio, uh, odds ratio larger than one. And uh, in the actual patients, we see a, a larger variation, but still uh, most of the, a lot of the orders were kept. So this suggests uh, first of all, there is a difference between the actual patient's single cell transcriptome and our disease model single cell transcriptome, but still we see uh, a clear correspondence of these uh, infer uh, interactions. Uh, to summarize, uh, we now feel that one of the reasons that contribute to the diabetes induced uh, endothelial dysfunction that appears to be irreversible is that uh, we didn't know that there are many new RNA chromatin interactions that are formed uh, in the diabetic patients endothelial cells. And these newly formed RNA chromatin interactions induce expression of a number of inflammatory genes uh, that contribute uh, to many of the um, desired phenotypes of the endothelium. And degrading uh, these chromatin-associated RNAs inside uh, nuclei actually uh, is a way to intervene uh, with endothelial uh, dysfunction. And so with that, I wish to uh, briefly mention the one other finding uh, that is uh, toward the question is of how fusion RNA in cancer are created. So a fusion RNA is a chimeric RNA that came from two premature messenger RNAs. Uh, here shown in this figure, we have premature mRNA transcribed from one gene and another premature RNA transcribed from another gene. But for some reason, uh, there is a fused transcript uh, with part of its exomes uh, originated from one gene and part of its exomes originated uh, from another gene. It turns out that uh, some of the uh, presence of fusion RNAs or even uh, fusion proteins transcribed from those fusion RNAs are characteristic of uh, subtypes of cancer. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, EML4 ALK fusion product actually defines a subtype of non-small cell lung cancer. Not only that, uh, a particular inhibitor uh, developed by Pfizer uh, is approved by FDA around 2011, approved such that one such a fusion gene product or a fusion RNA product is detected, uh, then uh, this uh, inhibitor uh, can be prescribed. So this is an example uh, where a companion diagnostics is approved at the same time with approval of this drug uh, in use in a subtype of cancer. Uh, 
And so when we went back to analyze uh, both uh, can, uh, non-cell uh, cancer, non-cancer cell line and patient uh, cancer data, uh, we observed from cell line uh, chimeric RNA-seq read pairs linking uh, these two genes, uh, confirming that uh, in at least in the cancer cell line, uh, there is formation of this chimeric, uh, this fusion RNA. So in one of our non-small cell lung cancer patient uh, from the tumor biopsy, we observed fusion as well. Uh, but from these uh, RNA sequencing read pairs, we can appreciate that uh, in the, although there is fusion RNA of between these two genes, both in the cell line and in this particular person, uh, but uh, it is different exomes that are fused with the ALK between the cell line and the person. And so from normal cells uh, in different cell types using IMRG technology, what we observed is interestingly that the RNA molecule of the EML4 gene are attached to the genomic neighborhood of the ALK DNA. So we see in this case a coincidence where the fusion RNAs two genes correspond to RNA DNA contacts from one gene to the other. And so in our validation experiments based on RNA fish and DNA fish, uh, so we actually validated that uh, at least uh, in this person, there is no underlying fusion gene. Uh, so this is a fusion RNA without a corresponding fusion gene. This is uh, a product of uh, transplicing. So in this, uh, so our observation is that the gene pair involved in RNA DNA interaction coincides with the gene pair of a fusion RNA. Our next question is, is this a special case or is this a general uh, phenomenon. And to ask uh, whether it's general, uh, Dr. Yan, uh, Zhang Ming Yan, when he was in my lab, uh, he investigated all the uh, fusion RNAs identified by TCGA from 33 cancer types. I believe uh, the TCGA consortium, uh, when they carried out systematic RNA sequencing from 33 cancer types, they identified a total of approximately 10,000 fusion RNAs. And if we were to plot uh, these RNAs uh, onto the chromosomes uh, with x-axis representing one gene of the fusion and uh, the y-axis, the x-axis representing the other gene of the fusion, here is the entire chromosome line versus the entire chromosome line. And we see that there's more fusion uh, in this region, uh, which spans for several megabases. There are some fusion here as well. Uh, if we were to then plot in parallel, what is the genome-wide RNA-DNA contact maps uh, in different normal cell types, uh, we actually see a, a global correspondence uh, between where there's a lot of RNA-DNA interactions and where fusion transcripts in different cancers uh, tend to occur. So with all of this adding together, uh, we proposed a model uh, for uh, fusion RNA biogenesis, and we wanted to call it, we felt it could be called as RNA poise model. So the model is the following. So the RNA transcribed from one gene, let's call it RNA1, is attached to the genomic sequence of gene 2. And when gene two is transcribed, we know that splicing of gene two of RNA two happens most of the time co-transcriptionally. However, at this point, because RNA one is in its spatial neighborhood, so that it increases the chance of splicing error. And thus due to splicing error, the two RNA molecules are spliced together to form a fusion RNA. So how can RNA1 in the first place be positioned in the genomic sequence of gene two? Well, uh, 
it could, there could be tethering protein, there could be more than one mechanism. Uh, one of the possible uh, mechanism is that uh, the 3D genome arrangement already made gene one's location in the 3D nucleus to be proximal in gene two sequence. So that in 3D, uh, these two genes were close together. In this particular case, whenever gene one is transcribed into RNA one, RNA one is already in the spatial proximity of gene two. Uh, that case uh, would certainly be the, the, the prerequisite of, trans, of splicing error to happen. That if this is uh, indeed the underlying, one of the underlying causes, also there are other data showing that uh, when the two pieces of DNA are close in space, uh, there is a greater chances of DNA rearrangement forming a fusion gene. And of course, uh, fusion genes could uh, be transcribed into fusion RNA. Uh, so this uh, adding together uh, would be a, a model for us to explain some of the RNA biogenesis pathways uh, to create fusion RNA. Uh, so trans the idea of transplicing RNA splicing error to create fusion RNA is not new. Uh, it has been there for a while. So one of the problems or challenges of this splicing error model is that for a splicing error to happen to splice two RNA together into one, these two RNA molecules has to be close to be spliced together in the first place. Uh, so imagine that inside the nucleus in the space of micron by micron by micron space, uh, the chances for two RNA molecules to meet in that huge space is not great. So that seems to, uh, to, to, seems to make the uh, splicing error model not easily conceivable if we take the space into consideration. So the RNA poise model basically says that through RNA chromatin interaction, uh, the uh, two RNAs were close. Uh, the soon RNA2 is transcribed. And also uh, that is one, uh, most of the splicing events uh, happen uh, anyways. So, so with that, I have described the, uh, the, the work related to RNA chromatin uh, interactions. Are there questions from the audience at this point? Yes, I have a question. So um, um, this is Hyamin. Yes, please hear me. Yeah. So is there any possibility of having like a uh, ECE DNA, like a extra chromosomal DNA? So they have a, they have the same, you know, different like, trans genes in the same place. They can actually make that happen with RNA interaction or RNA DNA interaction? That, that, that's a terrific question. Uh, it, 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 I would say it's possible uh, that, uh, I, was, I would say it's possible. And as the previous analysis, we have neglected uh, the, uh, uh, those, those uh, small, uh, small uh, chromosomes. Uh, now that knowing their abundance and importance uh, in, in, uh, in cancer, uh, we, sh we really are hopeful there are ways for us to find them back. Thank you. Hello, uh, Dr. Zong. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a question um, regarding this RNA poise model. Um, so, the RNA that is from the RNA one that's close to the gene number two. I mean, we're assuming that that's that's mRNA, right? It's not a long like uh, link RNA or any of that, right? Because I'm oh, asking yeah. because- Hey, John, it, it, this model doesn't preclude a link RNA. It can be any RNA molecule. It can be any, okay. I was just wondering, and then do these genes that present this situation, these uh, cells that present this situation tend to have um, mutations in the spliceosome related genes or why wouldn't we see this in the regular? So, uh, so there were previous studies that suggest that uh, errors in RNA splicing doesn't require spliceosome mutation. Uh, it is it is just an error. So it, when splicing happens for a lot of times, in a small chance, splicing error will happen. Uh, however, 
if the cells are stressed, uh, the frequency of splicing error increases. Uh, so, so that uh, mutation in the spliceosome genes is not uh, uh, pre so far, most data point it's not a prerequisite. And so for, uh, for, for a splicing error to happen. Thank you. So thank, thank both uh, for, for the questions. So um, I have a question for the audience as, as well. So what are the uh, photographed materials here in this uh, picture? Yeah, my favorite socks. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so, so microscopically, it's zooming in that uh, appears to uh, echo uh, both uh, Rong's and, and Sue's uh, uh, identification. Mm. So with the last few minutes, uh, so I wish to uh, uh, switch gear to discuss RNA on cell surface. Uh, is that a type of cell surface molecule? Uh, so what we I hope to discuss is a way of naturally happening display of the nuclear encoded RNA, RNA from the nuclear genome, transcribed from the nuclear genome, that is presented and stably associated on cell surface uh, and its impact on cell-cell interactions. Uh, so the first question is, does such cell surface RNA exist? First of all, cell surface is apparently critical for cell environment and cell cell interactions. So the RNA transcribed from the nuclear genome is generally not expected to appear on the surface of eukaryotic uh, cells, at least the cells with intact cell membranes. And so here I wish to define what, what are precisely the RNA species I wish to discuss. So we define this max RNA, short for membrane associated extracellular RNA as nuclear genome transcribed RNA that are stably associated with the surface of the intact cells and exposed to the extracellular space. So our goal here is to test for the presence of max RNA in mouse and human cells, and to test if any max RNA can influence cellular functions. Uh, we were not the first group who suspected the plausibility of max RNA's existence. Uh, it turned out that in the 19, 1960s and the 1970s, a pioneer cancer biologist, his name is Leonard Weiss, had a similar suspicion and he actually carried out some experiments to test it. So in the 60s, it was already known that cells undergoing metaplastic transformation, that is like a trans differentiation or, or cancer generation process, those cells, their cell surface tend to be even more heavily negatively charged like cancer cells tend to be even more negatively charged to their uh, pre-metaplastic um, uh, plastic, uh, precursor. And so in general, this negative charge were attributed to more glycans uh, due to uh, glycolysis. Uh, however, Leonard Weiss felt that, well, RNA are also negatively charged. Uh, he asked whether in addition to the uh, sugar groups, uh, whether RNA it may also be present in cancer cells periphery. So at that time, uh, what Neonet did was that uh, he uh, used the radio labels to label intracellular uh, RNA, that he at least he thought was intracellular RNA. And he actually was able to identify on the cell periphery those radio labels. In addition, he found those peripheral labels were sensitive to RNA's digestion. So therefore, uh, in Leonard Weiss's paper uh, in, in 1966, he said, he wrote, this results 
are interpreted to indicate that RNA is a structural component of the peripheries of these cells. And so uh, around his time, his papers were seen and cited by other scientists. For example, uh, Sarah Zalek uh, studied another uh, metaplastic transformation, a trans differentiation process, uh, where uh, Sarah actually did similar experiments and uh, reached similar, received similar data. Although at that time, uh, Sarah perhaps was not completely ready to, to take um, uh, Dr. Weiss's conclusion. And Sarah wrote, the nature of this material is currently under investigation while citing uh, Weiss's paper. Yeah, so these uh, pioneer studies uh, were not followed up uh, for uh, almost half of a century. Uh, so our goal uh, as an approach uh, as follows. First, we wanted to start from a lymphoma cell line to test if Weiss's uh, reported material are indeed RNA. And second, we wanted to test in primary human cells uh, if there is any cell type specificity and what cells present max RNA. And thirdly, uh, we wish to identify what specific max RNAs are on primary human cells. And finally, we wish to test if a specific max RNA uh, mediate cell-cell interactions. And for the first question, uh, how do we test if uh, these uh, potentially peripheral structural material of lymphoma cells are indeed RNA? So we leveraged a uh, nanotechnology uh, called membrane-coated nanoparticles, MNCP, developed by my colleague Liang Fang Zhang's lab here at UCSD. Uh, what this uh, MCMP does is that uh, Liang Fang's lab tees apart cell membrane and wrap it tightly around a nanoparticle core, and thus forming uh, a, a designed core that is tightly wrapped uh, by cell membrane. Uh, there are two unique features of this technology make it quite useful to us. One is that the inside out, outside orientation of the membrane is kept so that on the nanoparticle core, the inside is still facing inside of the membrane, the outside of the membrane is facing outside. Second is that any intracellular material is rigorously removed uh, during this process of assembling uh, such nanoparticles. So Leveraging this technology, we developed uh, a technique which we call a surface seek. Essentially, that first construct uh, MN MCNPs from lymphoma cells, just uh, using the lymphoma cells membrane, and then purify and sequence uh, any RNA molecule facing the outside of such MCNPs. So we developed two technical variations of this uh, sequencing technique, and I'm not going to uh, go into uh, details. So applying uh, these two variations of surface seek uh, to uh, lymphoma cells with different uh, repeats, uh, we've identified uh, 92 non-coding RNAs that consistently uh, reappeared in every of our biological repeat. So MANAT1 gene and MANAT1 RNA is one of the 82 uh, candidate surface RNAs. If we were to plot the five biological replicate uh, from two technical variations of these surface RNAs reads onto the MALAT1 gene, uh, we see that not everywhere of the MALAT1 RNA seems to be uh, detectable on the cell surface. Uh, whereas uh, this part of the, of the subfragment of the RNA uh, seems to be always presented uh, in every biological sample of ours. Uh, so we wanted to use uh, RNA fish to test if indeed uh, this part, this fragment, RNA fragment uh, is presented on cell surface. So uh, our single molecule RNA fish uh, seem to actually detect uh, some of the signals on the cell periphery. And uh, in our single base uh, mutant control probes uh, doesn't show any signal. So this uh, also we can use some 
uh, live cell imaging techniques uh, to, to test these cells are indeed uh, live cells. And so in summary, uh, what we find is that uh, RNA is indeed present on leukemia cell surface. And because this is RNA sequencing, we feel that the evidence for this material RNA are much stronger now. Our next questions are, is RNA present on normal primary cells from humans? And do all cell types present surface RNA? And so in order to test whether RNAs are present on normal primary cells, uh, we needed a way uh, to crudely label the cells that may present surface RNA. And we developed a technique which we, we call uh, in situ uh, surface fish. What we do is that we generated a random um, nucleotide library and we incubate this, uh, uh, this random library of uh, flora for labeled probes uh, with primary human cells. And we watch the cells and we image them. And then we use uh, these uh, probes to pull out those cells uh, to, for further analysis. Uh, if we, after wash, if we were to image uh, this uh, fluorophores with, and also image with antibodies against different subtypes of PBMCs, uh, we see co-localization or co-appearance of CD14 surface protein and, uh, and a putative uh, max RNAs on the same cells. Uh, so if we were to, to quantify this, in order to quantify this, uh, we split uh, the PBMCs into two pools of single cells. Uh, one pool are what we call ISFish plus. Uh, those are the ones that are pulled down uh, by facts, uh, facts separated uh, with positive fluorophore signals. And the rest are uh, the negative, which presumably doesn't present any putative max RNA signal. And then we subjected these two pools of cells to single cell sequencing. And uh, a Tisney plot uh, seemed to separate these two pools of cells, which is desirable to us. Then if we were to plot the expression levels of marker genes of different um, PBMC subtypes, here we are plotting in this figure showing two marker genes of monocyte. Uh, we see that uh, these marker genes uh, seem to, to concentrate uh, to the single cells of uh, the, the ISFish plus population, which coincides with our uh, microscopy uh, observation. Uh, that is, the monocyte seems to be a major Sur surface RNA presenting cell type in PBMC. Uh, to summarize, for, for the time being, uh, cell surface RNA is present on normal primary cells. Not all cell types present cell surface RNA, at least to our detection limit. And cell surface RNA is present on CD14 plus uh, monocytes. Our next questions are, what genes give rise to the primary cell cell surface RNA? And does any cell surface RNA modulate the functions of uh, their uh, primary cells? And to identify what genes give rise to a surface RNA, uh, we combined uh, IS fish uh, to sequencing. We essentially uh, pull uh, those purified those RNA by the antisense probes uh, library, and then uh, sequence whatever co-purified co RNA. And in order to minimize background noise, we actually uh, generated three technical variations, each adding a, a, some additional step uh, to, uh, to hopefully narrow down the RNAs that are indeed on um, either monocytes or on, on cell membrane uh, as additional filtering steps. And in the end, uh, we derived uh, a few hundreds putative candidate max RNAs. And we tested around 11 of them. Most of our tested candidates are uh, in the intersection of the three technical uh, variations. So how do we test whether a putative cell surface RNA may have any impact to the cell's function? Uh, 
Uh, first of all, among all the possible cell functions, we feel that cell-cell interaction uh, is where we are going to test. Uh, so one thing that we know about monocyte is that one of the critical feature of monocyte is that it would adhere uh, to the endothelium. Uh, we talked about endothelial cells of the blood vessel. So the uh, monocyte would adhere to endothelial cells and in the adherence is a prerequisite step uh, for the monocyte to migrate through the endothelium and uh, transform uh, into macrophages. And so this uh, attachment uh, is actually a quite well worked out uh, quantifiable assay uh, between monocyte and endothelial cells is being used actually widely as a way to interrogate a cell cell uh, interactions. So monocyte endothelial attachment assays uh, is a standard uh, in, in, in research of endothelial cell and monocyte uh, functions. So we wanted to leverage this and leverage the quantifiability of the attachment levels. Uh, so what we do is that uh, we um, we incubate uh, the monocyte with antisense probes of every candidate max RNA, every candidate uh, cell surface RNA. So we designed antisense probes against every putative, every of the 11 putative surface RNA. And we incubate such uh, antisense probes with monocyte for a very short amount of time for only one hour. And then we carry out, uh, we, we, co uh, we co culture monocyte EC and carry out the standard monocyte EC attachment quantification. And on the Y axis are the quantified monocyte EC attachment levels. Uh, as you see, some of the controls as expected control probes do not change the attachment levels. Uh, several of our uh, candidate max RNA may not have a significant change, but uh, at least two uh, max RNAs when we uh, interfere with the extracellular in the extracellular space, uh, they seem to strongly uh, suppress monocyte EC attachment levels. So uh, at this point, uh, we feel that there is data suggesting some surface RNA can modulate monocyte EC attachment level. Our next question is, does this uh, modulation require the entire RNA sequence or, or not, or only a piece or fragment of the RNA? So if I were to reinvestigate uh, this um, MNDC3 B gene, uh, so here is this gene on the genome here, here are the exomes and introms. Uh, the red tracks shown here are our uh, IS fish sequencing data, and you see reads uh, uh, aligned to different parts of the gene. There are a lot of reads aligned to the 3 tr of this gene. And the blue tracks are our different controls. Uh, as you can imagine, there's only a tiny amount of cell surface RNA, even if there is any, uh, so that it's important to contrast to, to, to various types of controls in, in every hour te technical variation. We have three, at least three uh, control replicates. Uh, so we then designed individual antisense probes targeting different parts of this gene. And uh, we had five probes uh, targeting different parts of the three prime OTR of this gene because there simply is more uh, surface sequencing reads uh, at the three prime OTR. And then we quantified uh, the uh, monocyte EC attachment level from extracellular incubation for one hour of every antisense probe. So what we see is that uh, the control didn't change. Uh, the oligos targeting some of the exons don't seem to, to, to manifest any, anything. Uh, targeting the, 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 the five prime end of the three prime UTR didn't seem to work but the more toward the three prime end, then the larger the impact is uh, to, to change the monocyte's ability uh, to attach to EC. At this point, we feel that not all parts of the, at least the, the mature transcript of the max RNAs gene are equally important for their cell cell surface functions. Uh, so if I were to summarize, and so the, this technique, a uh, surface fish seek, uh, 
can identify the genes of primary cells max RNA. And uh, what we have uh, discussed so far, uh, we feel that we have um, tested uh, Leonid Weiss's suspicion uh, lymphomas uh, cells uh, do not uh, do present max RNA on their surface, and it's verifiable by by both sequencing and RNA fish. And in in primary cell population, uh, monocyte is a major type of max RNA presenting cell type in human PBMCs, and blocking specific monocyte max RNA can reduce monocyte's ability to interact with endothelial cells, and blocking extracellular blocking of just a fragment particular fragment of particular uh, putative uh, surface RNA can reduce uh, the monocyte's ability already. So with that, I wish to uh, mention the people behind the scenes, the uh, Norman Huang, Dr. Huang. Uh, he is the one, um, the main person uh, who generated the data I described about max RNA uh, with uh, the help uh, from Xiaochen Fan, Cassia, uh, Zaleta Rivera, Chi Nguyen, and Zhang Mingyan. So Zhang Mingyan, I mentioned him uh, several times. Uh, so he is the one behind analysis of fusion RNA and also behind the analysis um, of, of the surface RNA data. Uh, Dr. Liang Fang Zhang's lab provided the critical uh, nanoparticle technology uh, for us to uh, derive surface seek uh, technique and Dr. Zhen Chen's lab provided endothelial cell expertise. With that, uh, I wanted to uh, open for any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Sen. This is a uh, sh super interesting biology and actually many, more, many pieces of super interesting biology there. Uh, so Ahmed somehow has internet problem. He, he is not able to uh, join again. Uh, so now if anyone has question, you can either unmute yourself or you can use the chat box um, to put your question in there. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, super interesting. I have a couple of questions. Um, two of them are sort of linked to each other. I was wondering if you could talk about your thoughts on what's the mechanism of RNA getting onto the cell surface. Like, is it from inside the same cell? Is it somehow picked up from the environment? And then like potentially a related question, what makes you think like, why monocytes? Yes, a excellent question. So uh, first, how is RNA get onto a cell surface? Uh, so if I were to forget about the human genome transcribed RNA, uh, for viral RNA, it's known uh, to be to to actually can get attached to cell surface. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the uh, toll-like receptors are meant uh, to target viral RNA, and as a way of of actually uh, by stabilizing and interacting with viral RNA, so the so the viral RNA are uh, uh, attached to uh, to the surface of some cells. So here the interest is to discuss how about the human genome produced RNA uh, rather than uh, alien uh, invasions. Uh, so for, so uh, our initial inspiration uh, came from bacteria. In bacteria, for how bacteria use a relatively small genome and allow for their transmembrane protein to localize to the cell membrane. Uh, one popular way is that after translation, the bacteria messenger RNA is not dissociated with the translated peptide of a transmembrane protein. Instead, the still connected messenger RNA actually contains localization signal for other protein to pick up and translocate the RNA peptide chimera to bacteria membrane. And then of course the protein peptide is needed to, to penetrate and stabilize uh, the transmembrane. So in bacteria, RNA is a localization signal uh, to, to get across the membrane, <laughs> to get to and across mm -hmm. the membrane. And a few years back uh, in eukaryote, 
uh, there was one example of, a, of, of a messenger RNA not dissociated and used as localization signal to penetrate at least to bring to and let the peptide to penetrate ER. Although there's not yet a, a worked out example uh, for penetrating the, uh, of the human cell plasma membrane, but a similar mechanism uh, is, uh, is described in one gene and one RNA actually is the localization signal to bring uh, the protein across ER mm -hmm. membrane. So that makes us to feel that perhaps it's just where we haven't found it and perhaps uh, the, this nice way of 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 uh, of of localizing transmembrane protein, uh, perhaps human genome still uses it. Uh, coinciding with this idea, although we haven't worked out uh, all the uh, uh, haven't worked out the mechanistic steps, uh, but uh, indeed, um, if we analyze what are the gene transcripts uh, in our uh, PBMCs cell surface RNA. It's heavily, heavily associated with transmembrane proteins messenger RNA. Uh, so that coincides with our initial suspicion uh, that perhaps the same mechanism is still used in humans. It's just that we need to work out the, uh, all these uh, actual steps of a specific example. Mm -hmm. uh, the other possibility that I would not rule out is just like any of our endocrine or paracrine signaling, right? So. Uh, for other, other ligands that are stabilized on cell surface uh, from endocrine or paracrine uh, signaling, we know that it, the, the ligand can be produced by another cell. Uh, so uh, that means that we probably, at least conceptually, uh, it's possible that RNA transcribed from a different cell potentially can be exposed and somehow, uh, just like a ligand, uh, get stabilized onto another cell surface. Uh, this process may or may not require the original cell producing the original, let's call it ligand RNA, uh, to be dying a lot or, or not. Uh, I can imagine a healthy cell somehow <laughs> deposit extracellular RNA as well as a dying cell. With respect to a dying cell, there is a process called phy phagocytosis uh, mediated by macrophage, monocyte, uh, and other uh, and T cell, these cells tease apart a target cell and take some of the cellular content of the cells under the cell under attack and present it on the host cell surface. Uh, so this attack, take, and display process uh, is, is, I believe it's called a phagocytosis. Uh, so that's a, a, a process that's worked out for uh, cellular, intracellular uh, proteins for most of the time. Uh, we imagine <laughs> that it's possible that a similar process is not only for display of the, the cell being attacked, the being attacked dying cells intracellular protein, uh, perhaps it's the, the target cells intracellular RNA or fragments of RNA could be displayed in this in a similar manner. This goes back to your question about why monocytes. Uh, while we are pursuing the possibility, uh, at least the current data is more like the monocyte displays on its own, uh, but uh, the monocyte also is, is a cell type participating in phagocytosis. Uh, so there is a chance that uh, through the similar phagocytosis process, it display, displays um, uh, genes transcribed from other cells. So those are, those are our suspicions. Yeah. I, I think that's actually the question I wanna ask as well. And uh, thanks, it's kind of answer majority of my, my, uh, my question as well. Uh, but I think on top of that, I'm thinking, uh, so if you, you can do something like a RNA pour down, RNA protein <laughs> complex pour down, something like a chip segment uh, for, for RNA, and you know what? So how the RNA is anchored on the cell surface? You know what? What? What is the sort of the partnering mm. protein or other mm. entity there? And you know, kind of better understand the mechanism. That's that's what I'm thinking. Mm. So the, the second is um, <laughs> when you were talking, I also suspect that I think it's some kind of phagocytic activity that might be associated with this. And you know, 
ha have you looked at kind of more mat mature kind of phagocytic cells like like a macrophage versus the monocyte? If you derive if you differentiate the monocytes into macrophage, do you see this kind of uh, max RNA presentation on a surface significant upregulator? This, this is a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so we haven't really uh, had the, 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 we really haven't matured those, but um, in line with your, your idea, we did a simpler experiment. We used LPS to uh, stimulate, uh, uh, mm -hmm. stimulate uh, PMC. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so they, uh, we see that these, the, uh, the surface, I call it a surface RNA, they're not an, uh, it should be peripheral, cell peripheral RNA by our enrichment method, uh, uh, a special class uh, that seem to be LPS uh, uh, activation inducible uh, from PBMC. Uh, so that is the, the preliminary data we have towards that line, but, but I, feel, mm -hmm. I agree with you that if we can mature uh, monocytes, that, would, that perhaps it would be a cleaner experiment. Yeah, but, but I think a lot more things no one knows. It's a complete new field you opened up, honestly. So this is super cool. So I have another question back to your earlier kind of uh, histone RNA interaction. So, so anyway, you can kind of verify kind of functional level, for example, like a, like a SHRNA or, or SRNA to kind of silent. That, that particular piece of the sequence yes. kind of interacts so, with the histone. So yes, so the, the oh for to the to the histone, mm -hmm. the RNA histone. So the RNA yeah. RNA um, chromatin interaction. So we indeed uh, I, I didn't talk about that experiment. It's an experiment done by Zhen Chen's lab. So she designed LNA uh, to specifically degrade uh, inside the nucleus. Uh, uh, this link uh, 607 transcript. Mm -hmm. And she can, uh, she actually, her data showed that uh, when this specifically uh, nuclear uh, degradation of this link RNA actually suppress the otherwise uh, stress induced expression of the subprime one, uh, inflammatory gene. Uh, but, uh, but cytoplasmic degradation uh, does not uh, have a similar suppression. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the challenges that we faced in trying to use uh, interfering or, or, or lockhead nucleic acids to, to degrade the, the putative uh, regulatory RNA is there's always a fear that we have um, interfered with the translation of that RNA. So that RNA, if it all, its own has a translation product, then if we knock it down, then, then, then what, 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 what are we testing? Are we testing this RNA's own regulatory function or are we testing the protein yeah. product of this RNA? So that's why mm -hmm. uh, we, we actually chose uh, this uh, not yet well annotated link RNA that happens to be transcribed from an enhancer. Uh, so that was in order to, to minimize the chance that we interfere with something else. Uh, so similarly to the uh, to the to the surface RNA interrogation, right? So if we were to do any genomic perturbation or, or in, intracellular uh, inhibition of this RNA, so there is always a fear that that uh, whether the, the intracellular protein get perturbed in that way. Uh, so that so far we are choosing extracellular uh, perturbation. Yeah, I think for the interest of time, there's a one more question uh, in a chat box, maybe uh, I think from uh, Constantine. Uh, uh, if you can unmute and ask, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Otherwise I can wait for you. No, all good. Um, yeah, so I think just one going back to the extracellular membrane localized RNA. So if the hypothesis is that mRNA can potentially serve as a localization signal, would it be a testable hypothesis that like fibroblasts pumping out a bunch of ECM proteins uh, would also be expected to be enriched for max RNA as well? Yes, I feel that's, a, that's an excellent hy hypothesis. And I like fibroblast because it's like, uh, so for some reason also for our, 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 we also tested uh, different cell types for just like a crude assay of whether they may present a surface RNA. This looks to us that more terminally differentiated cells are less likely uh, to, mm. to have detectable. So, so mm. this is 
in addition to, yes, they have all of us pump out things that, but also fuel blast is perhaps not a terminally. Uh, so that it's, there's just more, uh, it, it, we tested more than 10 cell types. And mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't recall fuel blast being per se, but in general, <laughs> they, 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 they not the terminally differentiated cells appear to, to, to more likely to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, no, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so it's a fantastic talk. Basically, uh, three fantastic talks combined in one. Uh, so I, I think also this is a kind of perfect talk to conclude our series four. Um, uh, we're going to have a series five, um, but Ame is working on a schedule. Uh, so we already have uh, people from, uh, I think, at 10x reach out to me. They are interested in speaking again and uh, NanoString as well. And, and uh, I think a gene fan from Johns Hopkins, we, we have four or five already lined up, but if anyone interested in speaking, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to email me or Ahmed. Um, so thank you very much and I uh, uh, hope you guys have a wonderful um, uh, weekend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. Thank, thank mm -hmm. everyone.